Stephen was mentioned to us a little earlier that he read a, a news article about um, the discovery of two extremely distant black holes um, colliding in, in the universe. <clears throat> and that, you know, while this has only become visible to us on Earth this last year, and they're, you know, getting more involved and in studying the, what they're learning about it, because it's not been seen, you know, it's unique in, in many ways that, you know, it's something that actually happened, uh, you know, millions of years ago and hundreds of thousands of light years away, that it's this, the visual impression of it is only now reaching our most sensitive uh, optics. It reminded me of a film I saw recently where they spent a lot of time with kind of three different groups of people up in the Atacama Desert in Chile. Um, it was f folks who were um, like archeologists studying the ruins of the ancient indigenous civilization that was, you know, very embedded and steeped way up in these high deserts that's really not there any longer, kind of distant human past. And um, this other group of activists, you might say, who spend time in the desert, um, looking for the more recent remnants of people who were um, disappeared by the dictatorship, you know, in the last decades. And then these astronomers who are, have these incredible telescopes up there looking at these kinds of experiences in the heavens of um, incredibly distant galaxies and planets and stars and formations and these collisions of such deep space and deep time. And that there's something about this just the high desert that's so dry and so quiet and where, where there's a capacity to observe and investigate these things in a way um, that's sort of shared by these three groups of people, but also very distinct. And so really a lot of time kind of looking at each of their individual stories and lives and um, explorations and then pairing them up, you know, having the activists go to the telescope and the telescope folks going to the archeologists and kind of learning from one another about what is it to gain a kind of perspective on the past from this rarefied position on the planet. And I think there's um, just many powerful things about it, not all tied up, not all um, resolved at all, you know, but, but a lot of interesting relationships and dynamics and questions. And I think, you know, this, this sense of how hard <clears throat> it can be to look at painful reality in the present moment, you know, in our direct experience, how hard it can be to look at it in the world around us, how hard it can be to look at it in the past, but that there is this sense of um, perspective that can arise over space and time that can allow us a, a different relationship with something that might be very challenging, might be very volatile still. The image of these telescopes, you know, uh, 
exploring and producing photographs and bearing witness to what are actually just like cataclysmic events that are kind of beyond conception, right? That that the 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 amount of violence and, and volatility of these galaxies colliding into one another and very well may be beings, right? In these situations that are experiencing this or that experience this however many hundreds of thousands or millions of years ago that this actually happened. But that with this sense of deep space and time there's a way that we can observe, we, there's a way to actually even observe the beauty of it. The powerful aspect of it that we call nature. We might call it nature partly because of the distance that we feel from it. And so this question of where, how much distance in time and space do we need to be able to come to a heart's peace and resolution, to appreciate the beauty and to even love. Something that might otherwise be very difficult, very painful. It's a very important question, I think, for all of us. And as yogis on retreat, you know, in a, in, a, in a similar kind of rarefied space, you know, we might not be at retreat centers, but we've cultivated and we will be cultivating more of a sense of kind of this protection of seclusion, of renunciation, of um, ethical conduct, and of commitment to mind culture, mind um, cultivation. And we see actually how difficult it is to be in the direct experience and direct relationship with that which might be painful, that which might be very difficult for us. And in, you know, in the Buddhist terms, there's, this isn't really just about big pains and big traumas and big difficulties, you know, it's, um, this is understanding that the, our momentary experience is very difficult, right? That there is a hardship at the heart of existence that's very intense and very powerful and very difficult to come into uh, close contact with. And I think it's interesting because, you know, we can have a, you know, a critique of something like telescopes or, uh, you know, this, the, for the same reason of like, oh, these are things that are, you know, kind of focusing us on things that are so far away and so irrelevant to what's happening right here and right now. But if you look at it in these terms, and at least in metaphorical terms, we understand as practitioners, as yogis, that actually there is a value and a need to find some place of distance, some space from the voltage and intensity of hardship in order to uh, build up a sense of capacity, build up a sense of uh, peace, build up our capacity to love and care in a more neutral, distant place sometimes and slowly build the ability to be with what is more immediate, what is more directly painful, what is more viscerally challenging. It's, um, it's an essential aspect of this path of practice, actually. And an essential understanding of actually the whole process of being and becoming that we're involved in as, as beings, not just as humans, but as beings that have mind and matter uh, bouncing off of each other uh, in this cyclical way that are so sensitive to whatever sense 
sensitivities we have and hearing, seeing, smelling, tasting, touching. We, we talk about dukkha, uh, suffering, hardship, the oppression of existence is, is not just in the fact that we are at times joined with that is, uh, which joined with that which is unpleasant, which is painful. You know, there are, there are things that befall us that create physical pain, that create emotional pain. Um, there are pleasant things that we experience that dissipate, that don't last, that we, we experience hardship in that way of the impermanence of and uncontrollability of, of things. But there's also very importantly, a quality of the human, the hardship of being that is not just about whether experiences are pleasant or painful, but just that their relentlessness that, that every single moment of seeing, hearing, smelling, tasting, touching mind are like these explosions uh, that arise in our, in our mind and our consciousness. And they are uh, unpredictable, they are undependable, and there's no stop to them, right? There's a kind of bombardment of sense experience that we can't control. Um, and that there is a way that this real, just the plain uh, overwhelm with of 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 the uh, impermanence of things, of the undependability of things, and the uncontrollability of things, even of our own minds, our own bodies. That is at the heart of this challenge we face. And one thing that we start to hopefully appreciate as yogis, rather than just judge and condemn in ourselves, is are the ways that the heart mind has learned to protect itself, learned to create distance from the volatility of the present moment. You know, I always find it, and I'll say this, it's like so funny that there's so many um, places where we will find a, talking about the present moment as this sanctuary, you know, as like, oh, find a divine refuge in, in the present moment as if it's this wonderful uh, thing. And <clears throat> in the Buddhist vision, it's not, it's understood that the present moment is, is awful, right? It is, the, it is this gushing flood of uncontrollable experience. And if it was so great, we wouldn't be running from it all the time. Right? We wouldn't always be trying to grab on to some part of it or trying to run from some other part of it or spacing out to like avoid the intensity of what's actually occurring. No, we sit as yogis, you come into practice, you're on your kind of second or third day here, dropping in and you see, boy, the mind does not want to be in this torrent of experience. The mind will do whatever it can to try to find some place of control, of satisfaction, of security and stability. And the way that it does this is through primarily the kind of realms that we consider, we will call greed, hatred, and delusion. Craving, aversion, uh, ignorance. You know, there's sort of different degrees and different language we use to talk about it. But I, I think it's impossible to overstate the importance of not judging the fact that the heart mind has used those patterns for so long to protect itself from this uncontrollability, that these are defensive mechanisms that we've learned and actually have worked to some degree, right? If they didn't work to some degree, we wouldn't use them. But it turns out that craving and getting what you want and trying our best to try to get satisfaction um, can at times produce a kind of um, solidity and stability of mind. It's, it's, it's not long lasting, <laughs> uh, it dissipates. And so it, it involves and requires the kind of creation of a compulsion towards that, creation of a mental culture heart culture, mind culture, personality, tendency, pattern of contracting around experience to, to maintain it, to hold it, 
to get it, to achieve it, to find some sense of security and satisfaction in that. Or we develop a version, you know, the disliking, the anger, the rage, the fear. These are a different kind of contraction of the heart, right? A pulling away, a separating, a division, a solidifying away from rather than a joining with. Also, of course, this works at times, right? There's a sense of strength that can build in that, a sense of um, solidity. Even if it's painful, there's a me that gets created in that. And that ultimately is where the place of delusion also comes in as a, whether it's a, the mind just spacing out and needing kind of distance from what's happening because it can't deal with the intensity of it or the kind of particular delusions of, of believing that there is this core sense, this core self, there's solid thing that's persistent over time, rather than as Steve pointed out, that the mind, the awareness, attention, consciousness is actually just as transient, just as undependable, just as unpredictable uh, as any other phenomena, just as dependent upon conditions as any other phenomena for its arising and passing. And, and the more we cultivate certain conditions, then the more beautiful qualities will arise. The more we cultivate other conditions uh, or abandon them, uh, you know, the more some of these more negative traits will arise. And so while of course we feel like we're, you know, victim or oppressed by the greed, hatred and delusion of the mind, they're, they're held in our tradition as, you know, the the poisons, the things to overcome, um, there's another place where we really will benefit from understanding that these are the ways that the heart and mind has found to get distance from the pain. And while they may not work in the long run, they may cause more pain for ourselves and others. Uh, they most certainly do. We also have to understand that we can't just abandon them. We can't just say, decide to stop using them. We can't just decide that they're wrong and cut ourselves off from them because the mind needs some protection from the voltage, from the intensity of experience. And if it doesn't have enough mindfulness, enough equanimity, enough energy, enough loving kindness, enough compassion, things that we may not all of us <laughs> certainly have not uh, fully developed. That of course, it's the mind is going to fall back on that which gives us some sense of security, some sense of safety, some sense of protection from the wildness. And so to just be very careful in this, in this dance, especially, you know, as we're getting quieter, uh, there starts to be at times, more sense of faith in the mind's ability to be with the present moment in a skillful way. That the mindfulness can be with a painful sensation in the body and still feel stable and still feel tender and still feel light. And that may last only a few moments. And then we see it gets too much, it gets overwhelming, the mind wanders to something more pleasant or fixates on something negative, right? Uh, or just spaces out into whatever this sense of really attuning to, wow, the mind feels protected by love. The mind feels protected in wisdom and understanding and seen clearly. And then other times when those aren't as strong, the mind doesn't feel protected. The mind feels threatened and it will go to, generally speaking, habits that feel very familiar <laughs> to most of us, you know? It's like, it's not like you show up on retreat and suddenly you're like this whole different person has arisen most of the time of like, oh, I don't recognize this aggravating pattern internally. It's like, actually it feels pretty familiar, most of it, right? You, you get more and more sensitive to it and there's like the, the intensity, the, the, the persistence of some of these patterns. Very hard, you know? Sometimes, um, can really lead to a lot of doubt, a lot of sense of whether we're capable of this. Very hard, especially again, in the first few days of a retreat, um, when, the, when the forces of the factors of awakening aren't really strong. And of course, throughout our retreat even, they'll come and go in terms of balance. 
but particularly in the first few days when there's more sleepiness or more restlessness, there's, uh, we're more susceptible to that sense of doubt. And so just, and especially if you're new to sitting at home or not in a retreat center, or not with other yogis, you know, you're back in a very familiar environment. You're going to, it's going to be sometimes difficult to relate to your world in a different way, you know, relate to your doorknob in a different way, your hallways, your kitchen um, as a yogi versus your habits. Because there's not that kind of sense of reflecting back to us all the time, like, oh, right, we're yogis uh, from, from the other people around us. And so there's that sense of like when we're in our sitting practice and our walking practice and the working, you know, doing our chores uh, or our kind of informal times. Rather than feeling like this is going to be this huge struggle between the times where I'm mindful and the times where I'm spaced out or the times where I'm loving and the times where I'm caught in some negative fantasy, it can be helpful to just really understand and watch the minds coming and going from those patterns. Um, that, that that actually is a, is a kind of way of practice where that doesn't always feel like you're just at war with yourself, at war with the patterns of your own mind and heart and body. The sense of like, oh, watching the contraction, watching the release, watching the tightness, watching the acceptance, watching the anger, watching the peace. The sense of like, of really starting to see that the mind will come and go on its own. You don't really have to do anything to show back up. You know, like your mind will wander into fantasy and you won't be able to stay there that long. If you're paying attention, you're going to show back up to just sitting there. And you won't necessarily feel like you did anything to get there. It's like the mind will have played out something, you'll realize it, and you'll kind of come back. And it can really create a different sense of balance of energy, where you're not, the energy isn't coming out of antagonism towards yourself, toward what's happening in the mind, but trying to understand and build a relationship of understanding. And that just this basic level of when, this, when the, the system doesn't feel safe, doesn't feel protected, doesn't feel strong enough or subtle enough or tender enough or um, fluid enough to be with what's happening. And the tools of mind that we're practicing aren't there. It's just going to rely on these things. And to try to take those away and cut those out or pull the rug out is really ultimately a kind of violence internally. Your system won't learn to trust you if you're always slapping on the wrist for every time you buy in to a greedy thought or a greedy impulse, right, or a wanting, you know, and uh, or, or a disliking or a delusion. It's like you have to, like, these are, these are going to be there on, on whatever level for a while. <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, third stage of awakening you've like you've uprooted greed and hatred totally right there's just like no more want need of a sense of like oh pleasant experience is going to save me or i'm afraid of unpleasant experience you've totally uprooted that like that's that's hard to imagine and to think that that's not even totally that like even that person still has a little bit of conceit a little bit of sense of me, a little bit of the mind is still finding some sense of safety and solidity in like, oh, me, uh, better than, worse than, equal to. And that, that's like the last thing to go before full enlightenment. So it's like, if you're going to be at war with it until that point, it's just going to be exhausting and it's going to be frustrating and your mind isn't going to trust you to be in relationship with it, to be in present moment relationship with it. If you accept and have some compassion for the mind that's afraid, for the mind that is showing up for this relentless experience over and over, and some permission and some patience, then there's a very different relationship that develops, a sense of ease, a uh, sense of patience, a sense of acceptance, and this sense of, of really caring about the heart and mind and having that care be what fuels us, be what we're actually, the mind becomes feel safer in, that it's a safer protection than just wanting. 
the peace is a safer protection than the aversion, right? The truth is a safer protection than delusion. None of us would be here if we hadn't had some experience of that, you know? So, so to also not feel like it's so distant that it's like, oh, uh, you know, you're not even trying. You know, all of us, it's like, you, we wouldn't have gotten this far in the practice. We wouldn't be showing up to things like this and dealing with our body and our mind for 10 days or, <laughs> you know, it's like, we wouldn't be doing it if we didn't know that there was some time where you had like a moment of relief where things were okay, even if they weren't okay, where you had the ability to connect with caring for something that was rather difficult. And that you just know, you trust intuitively that if you can experience that once, that it's just a matter of training. It, mean, it means you could experience everything like that. You could have total unconditional love for anybody. You could have total unconditional compassion irregardless of the conditions. Total peace and acceptance. That it's not listening, but a love that isn't so connected that it's drowning. Right? How these things balance one another. This is our practice. This is our path. And understanding the the, the mind and heart's need at times to distance, to find some security in the self, to find security in conceptual thinking. Is, is fine, right? We need to accept that sometimes we need that distance and give the mind permission to do that. And this is, you know, precisely why we offer the different anchors for the attention, right? It's, it's the same understanding that if we just try to sit there and observe all of the flood of sense experiences, there are times where we can do that and it's very powerful. But generally speaking, we will get overwhelmed right? There, there, there is, it's happening more quickly than the mind can keep up with in a, in a way that still feels mindful, in a way that still feels grounded, connected. And so there's this sense of like, okay, well, that's the heart-mind trying to be with the totality. But maybe that's actually beyond our training. It's not, it's not a judgment. It's not, uh, you know, it's not even personal. It's just a matter of conditions, that have or haven't been cultivated over however many years or lifetimes. And so the sense that, oh, maybe rather than try to be with everything, we narrow the field of attention to, to one aspect of experience. And maybe rather than try to narrow the field of attention into like the most painful part of our experience <laughs> or the most blissful part of our experience, where both each of which we will have less capacity to be with in a stable way, let's choose something that's like relatively neutral, right? So you're already sort of like creating some kind of basically the sense of distance, a little bit of space from the, the intensity and the voltage. And so, you know, often we will start with this like, okay, what is it just like to be with sound? Understanding that sound is sort of ambient. It is still happening here, you know, at the ear door. There's, it still is actually, like he was saying, physicality. There's a vibration in this physical uh, place of sensitivity inside the ear canal that is receiving sound, right? And that's what we experience as the realms of sound. But there is also something that we will tend not to conceive of sound as me and mine. It still has a sense of space around us. It's a little more understanding often that it's out of our control. Now, if something very 
you know, the weed whacker was right out the window. And it's like, you might think that you might be able to do something to control that, you know? So it's not like beyond our aversion, uh, but ba basically there's this idea of like, okay, can we go to something a little bit neutral, a little bit outside of ourselves? And then it's like, okay, well, what about narrowing a little more into the whole body seated? Can we be with that level of experience? For some people that feels like, oh, such a relief to have the whole pasture of the body be where we're noticing. Other times or for other people, it's like, ah, it's too overwhelming, it's too evocative, you know, that the, the body in that way is not a neutral space. So what if we narrow more to the sensations where the hands are touching? Check that out. Can that be a, a, better, a better place, a more neutral uh, area of the body to anchor the attention? So we go from like the telescope and the macroscopic more to the microscopic. And it's like, oh, if we go really small and detailed, sometimes the conceptual aspects of our relationship to body might not be so triggered, right? It might not be so apparent. And that's actually a safer place to be. Or with the rising and falling of the abdomen. You know, maybe that provides a little more movement, a little bit more motion. That's also somewhat regular. And so there's a sense of like, wow, okay, that's a relatively neutral, relatively, um, it's moving, but it's moving in a, in a somewhat stable way. Um, that can be a good place of practice. Now, there are many other places in the body, in, in, in the mind, that we can use as anchors, as sort of sanctuary spaces for ourselves, right? The Buddha talked about this practice as a refuge, as an island, a kind of like maroon colony for our hearts and minds who are uh, oppressed by experience, oppressed by experience in the world and just by senses, where it's like, where do we find some sense of a pasture that's the right size to be able to be with? And we're going to have tendencies among us that are going to be different, where someone might be able to find a kind of sense of stability is going to be different than another person. And those will also change. It, you know, in the morning sitting, wow, you might really like the open space. In the evening sitting, you might like the more narrow field. This is all part of the exploration. And it's also part of the exploration of how you're carving your time. Something that as a self-retreat yogi, you're more responsible for. And there's a a pressure in that, a challenge in that, but also an opportunity in that to really structure your day in a way where you're like, oh, actually in the morning, I feel like, for example, oh, I have more energy to practice and I like really feel quiet and I feel like I like getting up early and can kind of like, you know, do a sitting and walking and sitting and have that sense of continuity. And then in the afternoons, I kind of need to rest. Maybe I'll go for a little bit of a longer walk, take a nap. It's like, going with your natural patterns. Someone else might have the opposite, where the morning is really hard and it's like, oh, actually, you're not gonna need to force yourself to wake up at five in the morning. You know, that you actually let yourself rest, that you wake up and you give yourself the time to settle in uh, to a degree that feels natural, not forcing. And then when the energy is there, okay, riding it in the afternoon, like going for it and, and feeling like, okay, we're, we're stepping on the gas a little bit to engage, right? Again, it's this dance of like intimacy and distance, right? Of moving in, of moving out, of understanding that there are so many ways that we learn to, to be skillful uh, in this practice, um, to be able to do that. Some of it's spatial, some of it's temporal. You know, we will see, it's like the walking meditation is such a good place to see where the mind is trying to find stability in the next moment, in the future. So it's not just in whether it's pleasant or unpleasant. It's like you can see that it's so hard to just have the attention with the direct sensations, to, to be the heir of the karma of each moment as it's happening versus have the attention wherever you're going or whatever you're doing next or some future moment Right, so that the mind, the heart is looking for stability in pleasant, unpleasant, neutral. It's looking for stability in meanness. 
It's looking for stability and greed, hatred, and delusion. It's looking for stability in the future. It's looking for stability in the past, you know, so outside of this present moment experience. And it will provide something like stability, right? And be like, oh, this fantasy of like where we're going or where we've been. You can appreciate like, wow, this is amazing that the heart mind has learned to protect itself in this way, right? So really, it's a way that we can actually sometimes get into the quality of mudita, appreciative joy. Wow, the heart is really trying to protect me by going into fantasy, by wanting, by anger. That level of like, can you love the heart for that sense of protection? Love the mind for its delusion, for its greed, for its hatred. So appreciate that it's actually trying to protect us from the instability. And of course that love isn't condoning. It's not just like with another person, right? We might, it's like you start to understand what actually is love, what actually is equanimity. These things are paradoxical, but intimately related. Can you actually have love if you also don't accept? Can you accept without that deep connection of caring? It's humbling, walking meditation, seated meditation, doing the dishes. The mind is leaning forward <laughs> like all the time, you know? or leaning back or leaning elsewhere. It's like, oh God, it just feels that, that, that slight agitation, that, that edge, that tension that it applies to the present moment in order to find something next, something next, something next. And in the practice, are we trying to get concentrated? Are we trying to get quiet? Are we trying to get something? Or can we let the pressure go of our practice, find something more soft, more gentle, showing up for what's happening, for the tension in the mind, for the pain in the mind, for the joy in the mind, in a way that's relaxed, that's peaceful, but still energetic. But that peaceful energy, often we don't recognize it as energy. We associate energy and vigor with a kind of tension, with a kind of like contraction of the heart, mind, and of the body. And that's a conflation that's dangerous, right? That, that actually, the more we tighten, the more pent up that energy actually gets, right? It's kind of mental constipation, where it's like, oh, you're trying, you're trying. And it's like, then actually the energy isn't flowing. But actually in the rest, in the release, in the relaxation, we will often find that there ends up being ultimately more energy. And it's a balanced energy. It's a free flowing energy. It's an energy that's not um, at odds with what's happening. And so this sutta that is um, uh, available up on the flight site for folks who are not um, on the retreat right now, you know, it's the Sona Sutta, S-O-N-A. And um, you know, I hope folks have had time to look at it, to read it. Um, it's a very famous and, and powerful sutta. It's where the name of this retreat comes from. There's a quote from in there. Michelle read some um, early on in the, the opening of the retreat. And it, it begins with um, Sona, who, you know, has been a monk for a while. And I just think it's so important as a yogi to kind of go through his experience here in the beginning where he's like, I'm one of, you know, he's like, I'm so dedicated. He really, he's like, he's sitting in the forest. And I believe that the, the backstory is that he was doing walking meditation so intensely and for so long that his feet started to bleed. And he just wasn't getting quiet. He wasn't getting concentrated. He was just getting more and more frustrated. And so he gets to the point here where he's like, you know, I'm one of the Buddha's most energetic disciples, yet my mind is not freed from defilements. Then what? My family has wealth. Bing. <laughs> I could enjoy that wealth and make merit. Why don't I reject this training and return to the lesser life so I can enjoy my wealth and make merit? 
<laughs> and like, okay, we may not have the wealth that Sona's family had. That might not be the, the life we'd be going back to if we uh, left our yogi space. But that side of like, well, maybe I'll just make merit, right? The sense of like, why am I doing all this work? Like, I could just be a good person. I could go and do more good deeds and be a better neighbor and get involved and stuff. And it's like, that's not the issue. It's like, Sona didn't see the same moment that we often don't see. It's doubt right? Doubt arose in his mind <laughs> because he was having a bad experience because he wasn't getting concentrated. He wasn't getting what he wanted, you know? And the Buddha explains to him, you know, remember when you were a, a lay person, you used to play the harp and um, you were, you know, very good at it. And he's like, oh, yeah, I do remember. And uh, this sense of if you played, you know, if you tightened the strings too much, could you play well? And he said, no, venerable sir, of course not. If, you, if, the, if the strings of the harp were too slack, could you play well? No. And he says, thus it is with, with your practice, with energy. You know, you have to have a balanced energy. In the same way, Sona, when energy is too forceful, it leads to restlessness. When energy is too slack, it leads to laziness. So, Sona, you should apply yourself to energy and serenity. Find a balance of the faculties and learn the pattern of the situation. That's so profound of like really understanding the depths of balanced energy like just, and this is like what all these sutras are so great in a way of like showing that it's like, if you just figured that out, that could take you all the way. Or if you just figured out whatever, the difference between, or the relationship between love and equanimity, that could take you all the way. Or mindfulness of the breath or, all, you know, it's like you dig into any one of these things and you really get the essence of all of it because there is something kind of holographic about it, right? And, and to understand, it's like, if you apply yourself to energy and serenity, find a balance in the faculties and learn the pattern of the situation. Hmm. Right. That it's not just about control, not just about manipulation. It's like inclining and then trying to understand, trying to learn. And so as seemed to happen all the time back in those days, Sona got fully enlightened very quickly after this good talking to from the Buddha. And, um, He, he goes into this next part, and I'll just I'll just offer a little bit of uh, why I feel like this is important for us, you know. When he attained full liberation, he thought, I should go tell the Buddha, I should make this pronouncement, you know, in his presence. And so he says, sir, a mendicant who is perfected with defilements ended, who has completed the spiritual journey, done what had to be done, laid down the burden, achieved their own true goal, utterly ended the fetters of rebirth, and is rightly freed through enlightenment, is dedicated to six things. They're dedicated to renunciation, to seclusion, to kindness, the ending of craving, the ending of grasping, and mental clarity. When a mendicant's mind is rightly free like this, even if compelling sights come into the range of vision, they don't overcome their mind. The mind remains unaffected. It is steady, imperturbable, observing disappearance. And Michelle read this part the other day. Suppose there was a mountain that was one mass of solid rock without cracks or holes. Even if a violent storm were to blow up out of the east, the west, the north, the south, they couldn't make or shake or rock or tremble the mountain. Thus is the mind of the mendicant. When you're dedicated to renunciation and seclusion of the heart, 
when you're dedicated to kindness and the end of grasping, when you're dedicated to the end of craving and clarity of heart, and you've seen the arising of the senses, your mind is rightly freed. For that one, rightly freed, a mendicant with, with a peaceful mind, there's nothing to be improved, nothing more to do. As the wind cannot stir a solid mass of rock, so too sights, tastes, sounds, smells, touches the lot. And thoughts, whether liked or disliked, don't disturb the poised one. Their mind is steady and free as they observe disappearance. that sense of what is the relationship between you know, uh, renunciation and kindness, uh, seclusion, the end of grasping, the end of craving, mental clarity. Uh, I think that it's, it's important to remember that he's saying someone who's fully liberated is dedicated to these things. And so our minds might not always be dedicated to renunciation uh, or seclusion, or the end of craving, <laughs> the end of grasping, to kindness, uh, to mental clarity. And so we see that like the way to get there is not to expect the fulfillment of all of these things in each moment, but to come to understand them, right? To come to understand that through a very balanced, gentle, but vigorous, uh, kind, but patient and caring and um, clear and discriminating attention, um, we can come to understand the value of these things and how they relate to one another and to understand this, the power of renunciation, I think is something that is not so often talked about in um, non-monastic contemporary uh, sanghas or uh, traditions as much. But I think as yogis, it becomes obvious, right? The ways in which we understand that there's a powerful strength that develops from letting go of a sense of the sense of safety or satisfaction or solidity or security that we think we're going to find in the obtaining of pleasant experience or the rejection of unpleasant experience or the delusion of the self, right? It's a slow process, it's a gentle process, but there's understanding that this renunciation is not meant to be violent. It's not meant to be pulling the rug out from under ourselves. Uh, it, it, it has to be gentle and tender and, and experienced as lightening, <laughs> right? As uh, a relief of laying down the burden, right? As the Buddha speaks of, or it's kind of one of these phrases that, that people when they became enlightened would kind of recite these, um, these phrases. Where do we start to see like, oh, these things as a burden and the mind will take it up and we let it down and we'll take it up and we let it down. The renunciation is not just at the beginning of the retreat. It's every moment that we have the ability to see the strength of mind that is capable of feeling light and free and peaceful and strong. Um, saw, like the solidity that's talked about with the mountain and the rock, right? The stability, this unperturbability that comes through ease, through peace. It's not violent, it's not aggressive, um, it's not punishing, but an understanding of like, oh, do we really need this craving, the object of the craving? Do we need the sense of me to be so solid right now? Do we really feel like this is creating a stability that's liberating? Or do we allow ourselves to feel the pain of it, the dukkha of it? and find that place of a deeper longing for, for freedom, for relief and release. For not needing things to be one way or the other. 
And just like all these, whether it's the telescope or the microscope or the different perspectives we're getting, we're not obliterating the normal perspective. We're not saying that the normal social perspective or our normal sense of self is, is wrong. It's just that it's the perspective we have on it as the truth is not real and is not true. And that when you start to see the, sense, the range of experience of mind and body, of the sense stores, of consciousness, and we start to see that, wow, there are actually many ways that this can be experienced that are more or less familiar. It puts the one bandwidth in perspective. It says, okay, that's, that's one truth. This, that I am me and I have my story and I have my future and uh, have my past. It's not to say that these aren't true, but it's to understand that it's not the only truth and that by getting a deeper, broader, uh, subtler, more sensitive perspective on what's happening in the mind and body, we're liberated in the, in, the, in the mind's deeper understanding of truth, that the truth of how things can be experienced is broader and we're not so tightly contracted around the things needing to be um, in this very small sort of circle of what's acceptable, that what's acceptable and where we can find peace, where we can find happiness, where we can find a sense of connection is in a, a broader and broader uh, range of experiences. And that sense of stability and the sense of freedom is not diminished by the letting go of anger, by the letting go of uh, craving, by the letting go of the sense of me. In fact, we find that it's augmented, that it's strengthened, that our um, a deeper capacity to love, a uh, deeper understanding of truth is opened and amplified um, when we are allowed to do these things. And so then it's like the seclusion that we come into, the cultivation of kindness. Do we start to trust the kindness and the mental clarity as deeper protections, right? Then the anger, then the wanting slowly, slowly, right? It happens moment by moment, it happens. Um, and we'll have experiences where it comes together more than others. We'll have experiences where it really falls apart more than others. And this process is not just about maintaining that peak experience. Again, it's like watching it come, watching it go, watching the peace, watching the anger, watching the wanting, watching the accepting. And, uh, feeling the stretching and pulling, uh, uh, contracting and expanding of the heart of the mind uh, throughout our time together. Whereas that's the deeper peace where the mind doesn't need for things to be one way in order to feel like it's at peace, that it can be free in the contraction. It can actually be free within the sadness, within the anger, uh, within the peace, within the acceptance, that there the mind doesn't even need the mind to be one way or another in order to be free. So let's just uh, sit for a few minutes um, together. And explore all these dimensions. whatever is available right now.
So we have some time for walking, uh, for the folks who might have joined us for the Sunday sitting time, thanks for coming. And um, in half an hour, uh, the rest of us can get back together for the metta chanting and sitting. And just as a reminder, I said at the end of it yesterday, but to, you know, we'll, we'll do the chant call and response. Um, and then we'll keep the sitting open for the full hour um, and understand that if you're in a time zone where you need to leave at some point during that hour, that's fine. Um, but that we'll, we'll, we'll keep the space open for that time for those who want to sit. Take care.